Um, today, we're super, super excited to have Larry, Pastor Larry Levy with us. Um, I have known him now for 23 years. When I first became a youth pastor here in 2000, he was the uh, in charge of the youth pastors in our district, in Wisconsin Northern Michigan District. Uh, and then when I came back for lead pastoring, he was in charge of the lead pastors as the superintendent. Uh, so he has served with the youth, uh, leading youth pastors for 30 years. He served as the superintendent of the Wisconsin Northern Michigan District for 10 years, uh, spent another there are almost 10 years in ministry besides that. But at all of those things, uh, him and his wife have been just amazing friends of ours, and we're so thankful to them. Would you please just give a warm uh, New Life uh, welcome to Pastor Larry uh, as he shares what God's laid on his heart today. Bless you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's a little bit better. It's great to be here. I, I, uh, I love Pastor and Monica, and I love the way that they lead. Uh, they're real shepherds, aren't they? In fact, uh, I think we can do something a little bit better than a hand clap this morning for all of your pastoral staff, don't you? Don't you think you could stand to your feet and really show your appreciation, everybody, for this great staff? Come on. Amen. Amen. That's great. We love you, Pastor and staff. There you go. Thank you. You may be seated. Pastor's a great guy on detail. I uh, was on my way up last evening. I got as far as Appleton, and I thought I would try to find some cheap gas, and I didn't. What is That's an oxymoron anyway, isn't it? Cheap gas. But at any rate, uh, so I was in Appleton. I get this phone call, and Pastor Jay says, Hi, Larry. Uh, how you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. He said, uh, Are you on your way? And I said, Yeah, I'm in Appleton. He was checking just to make sure. He takes care of details. Got up this morning, showered, was doing my devotions, and looked at my phone, and there was a text, Eastern Time. I thought, Yeah, I know, but he's a man of details. He was making sure that I was going to be here at the first service. I love that. Uh, Love the staff, love, uh, love this church. Checked into the hotel last night. Clerk at the desk said, uh, are you speaking this morning? I said, yeah, and told her where, and she said, I love that church. I said, really? She said, yeah. She said, I come over on Thursday night. They have a class for me on addictions or whatever it was on Thursday night. She said, that, that church really reaches out to the community. And uh, I, I love those stories. I really do. And how that you guys uh, love your pastor, how that you, you love your staff. And, and boy, you have a great staff. And what about the worship this morning? Wasn't the worship team incredible? I thought they did a marvel, marvelous job. And uh, I don't know where that brother is that saying, how great thou art, but man alive, he... You ought to pay him. Well, maybe not. <laughs> the whole group and you as a congregation just joined right in. And, and uh, Jason and Jake and Wade and Waylon and Monica and uh, the, the entire secretarial staff and everybody, thank you so much for the privilege of being here today. It's a real joy. Well, today is uh, a day you honor your pastors, you honor leadership, and uh, we want to do that today. Uh they're godly leaders, they're very visionary, they're creative, they're hardworking, they're faithful, and they have the call of God on their life. And so I want to take a few moments this morning in just a couple of minutes and describe a little bit the life of a leader, not just as a pastor, but as a leader in your own home. Uh, we should all take a role of leadership. Uh, a little backstory this morning... Uh, when I was district superintendent, uh, men and women would come to our office to get credentials, and uh, we would, they would have done their studies and gone their classes and college and whatever, and then they would, uh, then they would uh, you know, do some ministry, and then they would take an exam, and then they would come in for a final interview. And uh, so the board of presbyters, the leadership of the network would 
would ask them questions and some would go over some of the questions of their family life. What is your family life like? What is your devotional life like? What is your, what, tell me about your finances. I mean, they, we kind of interrogate them really to make sure that they're solid in all areas of their life. Then I always said, you guys can ask whatever questions you want, but there's one question I want to ask them as superintendent. And they said, what is that, Pastor Larry? And I said, I want to ask them about their call, the call to ministry. Because let me tell you something, friends. If you are in ministry and if you're not called, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. I, I have seen them that thought, well, they, had a, they thought they had a call, but they really didn't have a call, and they got into ministry and leadership, and it was too much, and they just, they just went off. And uh, let me tell you something. Your pastor and Monica and the rest of the staff, they, they are called. They're called to this area. They are, I, can tell, I can tell watching their lives that they have a call of God on their life, and they're going to make it. I, I know that for a fact. I want to talk today just for a few moments, and I won't be too long, about the church. Uh, there's, there's a lot that could be said about the church this morning. Uh, I believe this morning that when Christ returns to this earth, and it could be very imminent, that he's not going to be asking about the universities of the Harvards and the Stanfords and the University of Michigan and University of Wisconsin, whatever it might be. He, he, he's not really going to be as concerned about that, but he's going he's to ask about the church. He's going to ask about you. What did you do? How did, how, how did you handle situations in life? And, and let me tell you something. If you remove the church out of our societies, we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. He's going to talk about the, he's going to ask about the little rural churches that are dotted in the, in the rural areas and where the pastors sacrifice and have to work a vocational job along with pastors. He's going to ask about your Sunday school class and your small groups as we heard this morning. And he's going to ask about the type of worship that you did. And he's going to ask about, about how you came through adversity. And he's going to ask, he's going to ask how, how you had that vision. That's what he's going to ask about. Because that's really what's concerning and what he loves about the church and about our society. Let me take uh, just a few moments and, uh, and talk to you this morning about a passage of Scripture that is found in 2 Kings, the 23rd chapter of 2 Kings. If you had just turned with that or look on your phone, I, I, I don't know. I, I spoke on it the first service. I'm not sure they had a chance to get it up there. But let me just read it to you this morning. 2 Kings chapter 23. Verses 1 through 3. Then the king called together all of the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the, of the Lord. Then the king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the people to follow the Lord, keep his commandments, statutes, and decrees with all of his heart and all of his soul, and thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book, then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. Leadership. I, uh, I love to talk about the church, and I love to talk about leadership. You know, the church is a very unique place. It's the only place in your community where people from all walks of life gather together and worship God. You sit beside each other. You pray for each other. You sing together. You do all those things together. On a Sunday morning, any given Sunday morning, you can, you can come and, and you can receive teaching and you can receive comfort and you can receive healing and salvation and relationships and hope and love in church. The doctors set by the farmers and the lawyers set by the secretaries and, and the pastors this morning set by whoever. I mean, it's just we all sit together and we're one family, aren't we? It's home. It's a place of worship. It's a place where we bring our gifts and our offerings and we bless God's work 
not just here but around the world. It's a lighthouse in the dark world. We gather to do God's business. The church cannot merely just focus on us. I had not been here in a few years, and I walked in this morning, and I looked over at the coffee shop. I, I think that used to be classrooms or nursery or something there. I thought, wow, this is beautiful. I looked at the floor and the concrete and how clean it was and how organized the church was. And when I drove in, I saw the new community center. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I'd heard about it, but I, I never saw it. And, and this morning, I got a tour through it, and I, I saw the I don't know, play center or gym or whatever it was, and I thought, what? my goodness, this is unbelievable. And I thought to myself, this is a church that doesn't just think about us. It thinks about their community. It thinks about others. And, and I was so grateful when I saw that. You see, most of the church ministry that Christ did was not in the temple. You read very few miracles that he did in the temple. He, he did them out on the streets. Wars are not won in the meeting rooms. They're won on the battlefields. If you want to rub shoulders with sinners, most generally you don't come to church. You go to where maybe in the marketplaces where you can develop friendships with some of those people. You see, strategy takes place in the meeting rooms, but testimonies come from the battlefields. Our focus must be outward. In 2 Kings, the 23rd chapter, I read to you this morning, about a king named Josiah who, after he read the covenant, turned a country literally upside down. If you were to read with me and go back a chapter or two in 2 Kings, in the 22nd chapter, you will discover that the city was in shambles. They sent scouts out and they, they checked out the city and it was pagan. It was like some of our cities in America today. I just came to Minneapolis a few weeks ago and... And the downtown area is still somewhat boarded up, and there's, there, there's crime. And it's not just Minneapolis, it's a lot of our cities, and, and they're just in shambles. And, and actually, if I look around the town that I live in, in Wapaka, I see that there's a lot of sin, and there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of ungodliness going on. And I'm sure it's true even in Escanaba, Michigan today, if we were honest with ourselves. So what do we do about that? You see, in the 22nd chapter, in verse 11, it says, When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes, his, his robes, he, he rent them. And verse 13 of the 22nd chapter, it says, it tells us, when they, when they inquired about what was written, they discovered that great was the Lord's anger because of the ancestors have not obeyed the words of the book or the law. They had, they had veered away from the scriptures. They had veered away from what God wanted. And on down in verse 16 and 17, it says that the Lord says, I am going to bring disaster on the place and its people. Why? Because they have forsaken me, burned incense and other gods, and built false idols. Kind of sounds like 2023, doesn't it? But what did it take? It took a leader. It took somebody that had a vision. It took somebody that, that, wanted to do what God wanted them to do. I want to talk to you for a few moments about that this morning. You see, first of all, what, what did we do and how did, how did Josiah change it? I'll tell you what. First of all, he stayed close to the action. You see, sometimes we want to pull away. We want to pull back. Josiah looked at it and he said, I'm going to stay close to the action. He knew the culture. He thought of the future generation. He became engaged. He got involved. He built a community center. Whatever it took, he he got involved. He understood the culture. You know what I enjoyed this morning? I'm not a young man anymore. I feel great. I thank God. I I can't remember the last time I had a headache. I, I, I think I've got great health of my age. And so... So when I, when I was a kid and when I was younger, we sang hymns. We, you could pretty well predict what was going to happen, what time in the service and whatever. I mean, that's just the way it was years ago. You know what I enjoyed this morning? I enjoyed the worship. I enjoyed the drums. 
Lorraine Kranz, are you, where are you at? Are you in here? Where? Lorraine, and Lorraine I've known Lorraine Kranz for years. <clears throat> I talked to Lorraine a little bit this morning. She, she went on some missions trips with us years ago. <clears throat> I said, Lorraine, you still play the piano? Oh, yeah, but not in church. <laughs> Sold the piano. I thought, good. She said, you know what? I left it for the younger generation, and they are just wonderful. That's the kind of attitude I like to hear. You know what? The church is kind of somewhat, they're, they're, they're still spiritual, but they're relating to the culture today for younger people and younger families and whatever. That's what it takes. We're not doing anything wrong. We're just, we're just associating with the culture a little bit. <clears throat> Look at what it says in the second chap, 22nd chapter of 2 Kings. Jerusalem was in shambles, and it says when the king saw it, he was distraught. What else do we do? Secondly, what did Josiah do? <clears throat> he became visionary. He became visionary. Oh, I love to have visions, don't you? Don't, don't, don't you love to be around people that are visionary? He looks at the future. He thought of the future generation. A visionary person sees what could be. It sees what can be. Visions drive us into action. I was, uh, as Pastor said, I was state youth director. And uh, I would run youth conventions and camps and things of that nature, or direct them, I mean. And, and uh, <clears throat> one day I was praying and I, I realized that most of my association with students were Christian kids. They were from our churches. You've got your youth convention coming up, I saw. In fact, I, I, I turned, I don't watch much TV. I don't watch any TV. I don't even have my TV hooked up anymore. That's another whole subject. But uh, so I, my wife does a lot of reading, and in the evening I'll sit and I'll do my devotional, whatever. And then I, I get my computer, and I, I look at the headlines and whatever. And, and uh, anyway, I, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to turn on Facebook. And I turned on Facebook, and it was Friday night. What do you suppose I saw? Your church having their night of worship. I watched the entire thing. I thought, wow, how cool is that? And so anyway, getting back to what I was talking about, I, I thought, well, I, so I'm, I'm dreaming and I'm thinking, you know, how, how can I change my district? I went off on a little tangent there, didn't I? Come back with me. And so I thought, Hmm. I know Dave Reaver. Dave Reaver is a Vietnam War veteran. Part of his face was blown off in his hands, and he does school assemblies. And as I'm state youth director, I thought, I need to have him come in and speak to my kids, our kids. And so I called up Dave, and I told him who I was, and I said, Dave, I want you to, I want you to come and I want you to speak at my, in our schools in the district. And he said, well, Larry, I'd love to do it. But he said, I've run a large organization. He said, it cost me several thousand dollars a day just to keep the doors open, all the staff and whatever. And I said, how much, Dave? And he said, $5,000 a day. And I said, that's not a problem. Come on down. I hung up the phone and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I don't have any money. I spent $15,000. So I started calling around some pastors and whatever, and they got excited with me. And we had Dave Reaver come in. And, and Dave spoke in these schools in the daytime, did evening rallies. And we had literally hundreds of kids come to the altars every night, those three nights, and accept Christ as their personal Savior. I took a little video camera in those days, and I videoed what, what was happening in those services. And the next time that the state board was meeting for our district, I said, I want to show you what God did in our youth this last week or two. I turned off the lights and put the projector on in those days and whatever, and I showed it to them. And when I got done, there were 10 of them in the room, and seven of them were sobbing by their desks. And they said, Larry, that is incredible. What can we do to make this continue to happen? I said, I really don't need anything. I just need you to pray for me. That was stupid. I should have asked for a million bucks right then. <laughs> that was the beginning of Youth Alive in the state of Wisconsin, and it's still going today. And thousands and thousands of kids have found Christ. I had a vision. I saw it. The entire 23rd chapter of 2 Kings is filled with actions. 
After, if you read down through that 23rd chapter, you will see what took place now and next and next and next as the leader, the pastor, whoever it was, took action and saw, had the vision and began to mobilize his people. He had a dream. Let me tell you something, church. Let's keep dreaming. Can we? Let's keep dreaming. Let's keep having visions. We're not there yet. We're just getting started. There's a lot to be done. Thirdly, he excelled in the midst of adversity. It wasn't easy. This, this raising a family, this, this church work, this, this, this whatever you're involved in, it's, it's not easy when you're, when you're serving God, is it? It can be tough. In the midst of adversity, it wasn't easy for him. He had to, he had to change the whole society. He had to, he had to go in and clean up. He, he sent the guys in, and they got the Scriptures, and they brought it back, and they brought the covenant back, and he began to read, and he thought, my goodness, in the human flesh, he thought, how am I going to get this done? In the midst of adversity, the late Robert Schuler once said, tough times don't last, tough people do. I want some tough people, don't you? Can we get tough? Let's get tough. Let's not give up. We need common folks like, like maybe Mother Teresa or Mark Buntain or some of these, if some of you recognize those names. I remember my third child when he was born was diagnosed with kidney failure. Actually, he didn't have any kidneys. They were, eat, they were cystic kidneys. They'd been eaten out when, by a germ or disease when he was born, before he was born. A few weeks after he was born, we kept taking him to the doctor, and the doctor said it probably won't live very long. And he said, the only thing we can do is give you a little syringe and give him a little shot of some high potent nutrition that his body might absorb for a few weeks we went home and i told our superintendent at the time and he sent the word out across the network some of you maybe remember this story it's been 30 some years ago now but everybody began to pray so i'm sitting there with my wife and one night she says i have an unbelievable pain come to find out she had gallbladders problems and had to have surgery so now my baby is over here only going to live a few days weeks my wife is now going to the hospital in the hospital to have gallbladder surgery and in the meantime some friends came by our house and said uh, well, how you doing pastor and I said well I'm, I'm struggling doctor said this and my wife is in the hospital now and I said well we're going to take we had, we had two older children and she, they said, we're going to take your older children home tonight. I said, no. She said, yeah, we, we, we talked to your wife. We went to the hospital and visited with her, and she told us where their clothes were and, and where the toothbrush was and whatever, and we're, we're going to come and take them home. You need some rest, she said. Well, when my wife speaks, God listens. There's a reason why her middle name is Doberman, not really. <laughs> so I said, okay. We went and gathered up the stuff. Took them out to the car. They were going to get in the car. My oldest son was 10 at the time. He looked over to me and he said, Daddy, I don't feel very well. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. My baby's supposed to be dying. My wife is in a hospital. And now my oldest son says, I don't feel very well. I remember praying a very simple prayer. And all I said was, God, they're yours. I, I Nothing I can do. I, God, in the name of Jesus, touch my boy. Amen. And they got in their car and they drove off. I went in the house and I sat in the chair by the nightstand. I looked over at my baby and the phone rang. You see, I'm, I'm German. I, I'm not bullheaded. I'm just right. And so people would say, can we help you, Pat? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. I, I don't like asking for help. And right now I am destitute. I'm at the bottom. I, I just literally gave my family to God and said, God, they're yours. And the phone rang, and it was my father. My dad is of German descent. He's passed on now. He couldn't speak English until he was in the third grade. He went to the seventh grade three times and failed all three times. Maybe some of you can identify with that. But anyway, uh, the county superintendent came out and said, uh, Ralph, 
you quit school? He said, yeah, I'm going to go into farming with my dad. And she said, well, tell you what, Ralph, if you come back to school, I'll put you in the eighth grade. My dad passed the eighth grade, and to this day, he'd never pass the seventh grade. I'll tell you something, my dad loved God. That old German boy, farming the dirt out in South Dakota. Every morning before we went to school, he had devotions. I remember my dad praying in the morning, and here's how he would talk to God. My dad would say, God, I've tilled the soil to the best that I can. Very simple. I put the best fertilizer on it that I could buy, get, and I bought the best seed I could buy. Now, God, if I don't get a crop, it's your fault. He talked to God that way. And you know why? Because God, Dad was a giver. He paid his tithe every Sunday. He gave to missions. He gave to anybody that had a need. He knew God. And so I'm sitting there now, and the phone rings, and it's my dad on the phone. And he said, son, how are you doing? And I was broken. And I said, dad, uh, I'm not doing too well. I said, Simone is in the hospital. Baby's not doing well. I just put Brad in a car, my oldest son, and he said he's not feeling well. Dad, I, I don't even know if I have enough faith. And my dad in his old German accent said, son, hush up. I said, hush up. He said, I've got you covered. He said, I just got done praying and I asked God for a double portion. I've got you covered. You don't need faith. I got it for you tell you something. That was 30-some years ago, 40 years ago almost now. Doctor said, if your boy lives, he'll be short and he'll be slow in school. I'll tell you something. wish I had a picture of him today. Actually, he's back in the States now. He's six foot seven and is a missionary in Malta, planting churches all over Europe. You see, in the midst of adversity, God showed up. In the midst of adversity in your family and in your home or in this church or whatever, God shows up. All we have to do is be faithful. In the midst of adversity, Joshua said, God said, the covenant says, and we're going to plow through and we're going to do it. And he did it. And fourthly, Josiah took the initiative. He said, the covenant says, and the promises are. Pastor will be speaking on a given Sunday morning, and he'll say, this, is, this, this, this isn't Pastor Jason. This is what the Word says. This is truth. This, you study this, and it'll change your life. You, you follow the, the, the instructions in here, and, and you'll be surprised, even in adversity or anything else, how you can plow through because God is still faithful today, friends. I don't care what you're going through. God is still faithful, and God will see you through. Well, he and the people began to move, and revival broke out. You see, it's a teamwork. It's a family. When I was elected as district superintendent, I would, as youth director, I would have smoke going up during worship, and I would have, and this was this is when you didn't, you didn't have smoke going up. I, I was doing it, and I would, I would, I was trying to be creative and relative to the culture and whatever and such and so I would do. So then next thing you know, I'm elected district superintendent and I think a lot of the lead pastors thought, oh boy, what are we going to get now? What are we going to do? And I remember when I was elected and they asked me to stand up and say something and I thought, I, I know my weaknesses and I know my inadequacies and I, I, I know I can't do this by myself and I had all the office staff sitting towards the front and I got up and I said, friends, let me tell you something. The God that you elected can't do this alone. And there were 678 credential holders in the network that were there. And I said, I need you. My team is 678. We're going to do this together. And it was amazing how God began to work in people's lives and in churches as we worked together. 
your lead pastor and your staff stand up here every Sunday. I appreciate it so much what the deacon said this morning about what goes on behind closed doors because you never know. The nights that they wake up can't sleep because of what they heard about your family or your life or your sickness or whatever. It's the call of God. That's what they do. And so with that, God began to move as Josiah said, we're going to do this. Recently, I was in a cemetery. My nephew, who had been in the ministry for years, was in a car accident about six weeks ago, tragically killed on a highway. I love Dan. Him and I had so much in common, and I couldn't believe it when I got the phone call. He was killed in a car accident. And so my wife and I, we go home, and I do the funeral. We go to the graveside. I walk up to the grave, and there's my father, my mother, my one brother, and now we're going to lower the casket of my nephew in the ground. It was tough, real tough. I'm walking out of the cemetery, and my wife's got my arm, and I stop. She said, honey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just looking at gravestones reading in inscriptions. A little bit later, I said, Honey, I wonder how many dreams are buried here in this cemetery. She said, What do you mean? I wonder, I just wonder how many people God spoke to their heart or they had a dream to do something and they thought, I can't do that, and they never did it. And when their life was over, the dream was buried with them. She kind of looked at me like, you're a little bit weird. I thought, well, maybe I am. Let me tell you something, friends. I believe God is speaking to some of you this morning. And you've let some of those dreams go. And God wants to speak to you afresh and anew and touch you. Some of you came in here this morning and maybe you're not feeling well. And God wants to touch you this morning. The same God that spoke to Josiah in 2 Kings chapter 22 is the same God that's here this morning, I declare. He's the same God that as you study the Scriptures and listen to the message of your pastors, will do the same thing He did for the city of Jerusalem. And He can touch you this morning. I pray that you will keep dreaming. I pray that you'll continue to, to have fresh visions and I pray that you will allow God to continue to use you. That someday, when we stand before him, we can say, thank you, Lord, for using me. Would you stand to your feet this morning as I close in prayer? Heavenly Father, I, I thank you this morning for this congregation and for this church. I thank you, Lord, for Pastor Jason and Monica how that they have given of themselves so diligently and so faithfully to this congregation. And we honor them this morning, Lord. We're so grateful they're a part of this network and a part of this community. I thank you for the vision of this congregation as they literally went in debt to reach out to this community with that rec center. I thank you for those that have given so faithfully to see the dream and the vision come to pass. And I pray you'll continue to provide for them. I thank you, Lord, for the group that went to City on a Hill yesterday and ministered to the less fortunate in the city. And those that are going to go to Mexico, I pray, God, that you will bless their ministry when they go. And, Father, I pray that this church will continue to be an incredible lighthouse in this community. And, Father, if there are some this morning that need a touch in body, I pray in the name of Jesus. Scripture says, by your stripes we are healed, that you would touch bodies. If there are some that are discouraged this morning, I pray, God, that you would encourage their hearts and touch them. Minister in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.